Welcome to the Ag Emerge Podcast, brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. Your farming challenges are unique, so your practices should be too. We're here to share emerging ideas, build connections, and provoke conversation. Get ready to improve your soil, your crops, your livestock, and your family's livelihood. I'm your producer, Kim Chase. And I'm your host, Monty Bottens. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Today, we welcome Dr. Christian Krepke, a professor in the Department of Entomology at Purdue University, where he focuses on insect pest management in field crops. His research has concentrated on illuminating the strengths and weaknesses of the primary pest management approaches used in corn and soybeans. And he has a special focus on Bt corn and neonicotinoid seed treatments. Dr. Krepke and Monty discuss the resilience of nature and just how fast it bounces back. Back. They discuss what we've learned about preserving the biology in the soil and how to reconsider those pest management systems. So much great information to cover. So let's jump right in. Welcome everyone to this episode of the Ag Emerge podcast. I'm excited to be joined by Dr. Christian Krupke of Purdue University, home of the Boilermakers. And uh, he's been doing some amazing things in uh, uh, research in regards to some popular things that we just accept as conventional and normal. So I'm looking forward to him expanding our minds uh, here today on this episode. So welcome, Dr. Krepke. Thank you, Monty. Happy to be here. Well, tell us tell us a little bit about yourself, your story, and, and kind of the journey you've been on through uh, all of your, your career and, and academia and research. Sure, I'll, I'll give you the, uh, the brief version here. Um, let's see, where should I start? Let's, let's, uh, I guess where I could begin is growing up in Canada. Um, I, I lived and grew up in Canada until I was about 30 years old or so when I came to the States and um, always had an interest in biology, um, all sorts of living things, but especially things like um, insects and crayfish and frogs and snakes and what you would call creepy crawlies. So nobody was surprised when I went into entomology as a uh, uh, graduate degree. Some people were wondering how I would make a living doing that, um, but <clears throat> I, I figured it out uh, and eventually made my way from Canada down to the U.S. Uh, for my PhD, where I did some work in uh, Orchard systems uh, in apples, specifically uh, pest management of stink bugs and apples. And in 04, I finished that degree, uh, the PhD, and that, that same year I applied for a job at Purdue. Uh, and it said field crops entomologist. And I thought, well, whole crops grow in fields. I could probably handle that. Not knowing that field crops meant something pretty specific. So I had no experience with corn or soybeans. Um, Growing up, I grew up near Toronto, Ontario, Canada, which is not the farm part of Canada at all. Um, and uh, so I got here in 05 and and um, started to figure out, you know, some of the, the mechanisms of corn and soybean pest management, what the key pests were, and how most of all, how different that system is from perennial cropping systems uh, like apples, where... Uh, people eat the eat the eat the crop, you know. So there's a lot of constraints on what you can apply. There's a lot more awareness on the part of the consumer about how these crops are grown versus corn or soybeans, which are primarily grown for um, not for direct human consumption, let's say, for other markets and other purposes. So they were very very different systems in that way. Uh, that immediately struck me. Um, and the other thing that struck me is that. When you stand in the middle of a cornfield, it's just you and all these corn plants, which are genetically identical. And that's it. If you're in the middle of a big field, there's not much else going on out there. You don't really, really see many other things happening because it is so large and the weed control is so thorough. Uh, the insect control is often so thorough that it's it's very different than being in other systems in orchards and vineyards and so forth. Uh, and you also can't see when the corn gets tall. 
So it was a real, it's just a long way of saying it was a real culture shock um, to get here at first and to figure out the nuts and bolts of, of corn and soybeans versus the systems I'd been familiar with. Yeah, there's a big difference in the perennial crops. I had the opportunity to work in California for a period of time. And, you know, while there is, you know, pretty clean floors in most cases, there is an opportunity for uh, cover crops, which we recommend, and high diversity plant species on those floors, encouraging insect activity and, and hosting beneficial, you know, predator type of uh, insects that, that can complement a, you know, integrated pest management system. So, I was doing a little uh, Google creeping on you ahead of our podcast, and I one of the things I did get uh, um, that I think is a real quotable uh, is uh, IPM doesn't necessarily stand for Integrated Pest Management anymore. It seems like <laughs> it has uh, changed to uh, uh, those three letters now stand for something else. I thought uh, you should share that with our audience, it seems. Yeah, yeah. The the I in, in many of these systems, uh, meaning corn and soybeans, these annual cropping systems, the I has sort of come to stand for insurance pest management. And that was something um, that I first talked about with uh, Mike Gray, who was a, a field crop entomologist at the University of Illinois. He's retired now. Um, but, you know, and he worked briefly for Monsanto when Monsanto was still around also. But most most of his career was at U of I. And it strikes me that that's mostly what we're doing. We're trying to avoid the worst outcomes and get insurance against a whole litany of things that might happen in terms of insects and diseases. But we're not necessarily basing our um, pest management approaches on decision points, economic thresholds, the presence of insects or damage, the presence of pathogens and disease. It's much more uh, based upon um, what might happen and how do I guard against that bad outcome? Um, and I understand the appeal. I understand the convenience. I understand the uh, the need to control as much variability as you can in, in farming or really in life. Uh, but there's a downside to it too. And that's what we're starting to see and starting to uncover a little bit. Um, and, and that's been an area I've been interested in is in, in questioning, is this really the best way? Is it really one size fits all for all corn and soybeans in the U S because that's basically what we're doing. And as, as you know, and your listeners know, um, it's very different uh, from state to state. Uh, what you see in terms of, climatic factors, soil factors, uh, pest pressures, drought, uh, and so on and so on. So it, you know, what, what we've tried to do is uncover some of the areas where those insurance-based approaches that are made when you purchase the seed in, you know, October or November may not be in the long run or even sometimes in the short run advantageous uh, to either your short term, like bottom line, does it pencil out type things or long term things like sustainability and, um, you know, keep keeping, keeping that land productive for decades and not just a handful of years. So I think maybe a good way to kind of set this up is we're, we're paying an insurance premium. And uh, I don't know a single farmer out there that likes insurance, you know, they don't like to write the, the check for the uh, liability insurance or the, you know, physical damage insurance. They don't, they don't really care to write that big check for crop insurance. Right. Mm -hmm. But we're, but we're writing checks for this insurance concept constantly in the name of yield, mm -hmm. you know, for uh, neonic seed treatments, for example, or for BT uh, corn borer rootworm resistance and multiple events of that. Mm -hmm. And we're writing the check for fungicide. Uh, be, and because we're over top of the field, you know what, it's only an extra three or five dollars for a, a broadcast insecticide to knock down any of those you know, bad little critters that are, are going to possibly hurt us. And um, that mindset has really shifted, hasn't it, since the advent of GMOs, because almost GMOs and seed treatments came out at about that same time. We have a higher value seed that we've paid for. So, oh, we need to protect it. It just and then it's just blossomed into this protect, mm -hmm. protect, protect, protect. Yeah. Um, how did we get here? 
Ah, uh, that's an interesting question. And I wondered that too. And I started digging into it a little bit. And 2004 is the year that in corn, we had our first commercialized uh, rootworm BT. So our first below ground, and that was yield guard. That was a Monsanto product. And that, that toxin is still out there today in, in the form of smart stacks and other hybrids. In that same year, we first started treating our corn seeds uh, with clothianidin, uh, which was usually called poncho back then. It has other names too. And if you look back at that initial patent, uh, there's a there's a Google, sort of a part of Google where you can look through patents. Mm -hmm. And you look through there and you find that initial patent and that rootworm BT event and the C treatment are in there together. They're together. They're locked in together. They've always been together. They've yep. never been apart. One of the reasons, the reason that it was initially given is that um, although the rootworm toxin covers rootworms and controls them, it doesn't do anything against some of the other below ground soil pests. The secondary true. pests. Yeah. That is true. The other thing I think that is important is that the rootworm BT was never high dose. It was never a heavy hitter like our corn borer BTs are which was our previous major one we were accustomed to. There was unquestionably a, a home run success as far as VT crop could ever, you, you really can't improve upon it, I would say. This was very different. And so I think there was a recognition at some point by someone or multiple individuals that you, you needed to maybe safeguard this technology a little more, put a little more killing power on the seed because you didn't quite have enough to stand up against, uh, you know, high populations of rootworm alone. Not that the neonicotinoids are great against rootworm, but two modes of action is always better than one. So I think on the corn side, that's a big, was a big vehicle of what got us here. Uh, and then they became, that technology took off, was extremely popular. It just so happened I got here in 05, right as this was all beginning. So I got to see this rise of, of the BT, uh, for rootworms and the rise of the seed treatments. And I think as it became more and more popular and as it became more and more um, ingrained, we eventually and rather quickly got to a point where not having corn with seed treated was not really an option on the menu, you know, without neonicotinoid seed treatments. It was, there was no such thing really. Or if there was, it was very difficult to get. And I saw that firsthand when we started to do some of this research, it would dwindle away to nothing in terms of getting the elite hybrids, you know, from the big seed companies, but saying, I would like to have this elite hybrid naked. I would like to have it with insecticide only, fungicide only, and then both. Because then you can do the true comparison, factorial experiment. It wasn't very long before you couldn't get that anymore. You just could not find those a la carte sort of approaches. Um, and it, I think the economy of scale dictated that if we treat every seed, we being a, the seed manufacturers now, if we treat every seed the same, that's the most efficient way, you know, that's the most efficient way to get corn seed out there is to treat everything all the time. And initially there was this, you know, um, movement or at least talking about, we only want the right products where they're useful we want, and all that sort of thing, but that didn't really last long. So it wasn't long before we, we went into this one size fits all and everyone's funneled into this one lane of this is corn. Do you want corn? Well, this is what it's got on. And otherwise you're gonna be shopping in the bargain aisle kind of thing, you know? It, it yeah. didn't take long to get there, that's for sure. So before we got on here, I went on to the manufacturer of a popular seed treatment. Um, they have bigger uh, legal departments, so I won't mention names. Um, but they said on there, when you go from the uh, two, 250 version or 0.25, I believe, mm -hmm. micrograms per seed or milligram, you would know better. I apologize on that. When you mm -hmm. go from the 250 to the 500, we gain 10 bushel to the acre. And it only costs 14 or $15 more for that. And as corn high price the way it is, you know, that is just a great return all the time. And also they have research on there at the 1250 uh, over, you know, just insecticide alone 
we get 3.7 bushels and, and over, you know, no insecticide, we gain 13.5 bushels. So there's a lot of um, marketing out there. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, I, you know, using Google, you can, you can find some things where there's a, a large meta, meta uh, analysis that's showing that over a large number of plots, there is no yield advantage to neonics. Mm -hmm. What's the deal? I can't comment on anyone's data that I haven't seen, of course. Correct. Um, Correct. But what, I've heard okay, same. let me ask. Let me ask you this better. What has been your observation when you compare a non-seed treated yeah. to a uh, seed treatment with, um, you know, good IPM as an in integrated pest management? Yeah, we've done that a few times over the years in a few different ways. Um, in Indiana, we've done it with partner states as well. We've been part of larger projects, and the short version is we have not found. Uh, a consistent benefit in corn or soybeans. Um, we just haven't found it. And and does that mean that they never work? No, of course not. But what it does mean, and what it, what we've seen in our uh, other research is that you don't have the pest pressure for the pesticide, which is very short lived in the plant, to demonstrate its effectiveness. So. The reason that neonicotinoids work as seed treatments, and let's say pyrethroids don't, is water solubility. So if you coat a seed with, with, a, with a pyrethroid, let's say lambda cyhalothrin, very popular pyrethroid, it's been around a long time. You coat it with that somehow. That compound is not very water soluble. So you'd essentially be sealing that seed up. It wouldn't imbibe water, wouldn't germinate, it wouldn't grow, or at least it wouldn't in a, in a way that you would that you would like. Neonicotinoids are extremely water soluble, and therefore, when water is imbibed by the seed, the neonicotinoid comes with it and goes into the plant. So the question is, how long is that there? And that was one of the first sets of experiments we did in both corn and beans, is to answer that question: How long is that resident? How long is that detectable in the tissues? And what we found is that you're looking at a maximum, and this is detectable. This is, doesn't guarantee insect killing or insect deterrent. You're looking at a maximum of under three weeks where you can find it. That's the day the seed hits the ground. That's not germination or, or, or uh, you know, um, visible above ground plant parts. So you're paying for a window of a maximum of, you know, 17 days or something like that, where an insect pest would have to encounter that plant to get a pest management benefit. So we have infrequent pests and we have a pesticide that is not there for very long. You have to have both of those things line up to have a pencil out. And I think the reason we don't see a pencil out reliably is because you don't have both of those conditions met very often. And I've had people say, well, in the past we did and we've depleted the pest population so that they're not a problem anymore. Maybe that may be true. I don't have any data to, you know, longitudinal data on pest numbers to refute that or, or support it. That could be. I only know that now when we look for those below ground insect pests in damaging populations, they are difficult to find. And I've looked for those fields. I've requested those fields from audiences that I speak to because I want to go where I can learn and I can learn where there's lots of pest infestation but I haven't had any takers on that. And so the work we've published is indicative of what we've seen in Indiana and elsewhere. And it's not just here at Purdue, other people have done this work too. Uh, they've done a lot of it in Canada, uh, in Ontario, Quebec, where they do grow quite a bit of corn uh, actually, and seeing the same thing. So uh, I think that's the reason, that's how we support, that's the mechanism behind our data. Uh, the data that show these these yield improvements year over year, I don't I don't know about those or I don't know anything about them, so I can't really comment on them. But um, yeah, I th I think the data speak for themselves. I'm always happy to see other data and talk about them and and go visit the fields is even better. Okay, so in your experience and what and the large data sets that you've worked with, not really seeing any yield advantage, mm -hmm. and you just said that oh well, it's maybe effective for three weeks. It's so water soluble. Um, okay, it's one thing, um, uh, not having an economic return, 
Uh, but eh, only three weeks of effective. What's the big deal? What's the problem with this? If it's uh, water soluble and it's not effective for very long, eh, so what? What's the big deal around these you neonics? Know, yeah, well, and and this these next comments go for any pesticide. Um, we we know that any pesticide we've used in large amounts um, carries the risk of unintended consequences because these are toxic materials. Whether you're talking about fungicides, herbicides, insecticides, you will have some collateral damage if you use them on large acreages and. We could sit here and go through literally hundreds of papers uh, and just in the last five or seven years that have looked at neonicotinoids effect on every kind of insect. Um, they've looked at mammals, they've looked at uh, aquatic organisms and so on. And you know, to make a long story short, there are unintended negative consequences. There are things happening that we don't like that aren't beneficial to us and in some cases are are negatives um and so that's an old story that goes all the way back to the the silent spring rachel carson days and ddt and eggshell thinning um it was very a very similar story uh insecticides are tools they're powerful tools they have to be used you know judiciously like any tool does um, putting them on all of the seeds or virtually all of the corn seeds, many of soybean seeds and cotton seeds is a, a sledgehammer approach that I don't think, I, not that I don't think, I haven't seen any data justify the levels of use that we've had. Um, and if you talk to farmers, which, you know, the last couple of days I was, I was talking to farmers that have tried, you know, and gotten insecticide free seed. And they said they haven't seen any any differences. They haven't seen any pest infestations or outbreaks. Um, does that mean we could go to an insecticide-free corn and soybean world tomorrow? No, it doesn't mean that. But it means there's a lot of room between that and everything treated all the time, which is the case in corn in the in the United States. Um, and so, and it, any listeners that want to look delve into this farther, they can look at a lot of the data that was generated in the EU and in Canada, where they really dug into this topic before they issued some, um, you know, moratoria and bans and restrictions on neonicotinoids. It's a, it's a long, long story, but, you know, the bees are the ones that uh, were the headliners for the longest time, uh, specifically honeybees, because as it turns out, bees are a lot easier to kill than a lot of pests because they don't have a lot of the enzymes that pests have to detoxify um foreign compounds so bees start dying before other things start dying people have made the analogy it's a, that they're the canary in the coal mine when they start dying you got to pay attention and so that's you know that's kind of actually what got us started on this whole thing was our bee biologist at the time he's retired now greg hunt called me and said in april this was of 2010 or 11 i think 11 and he said Bees are dying at the at our bee yard. What's going on? What are they putting on corn? I said, well, nothing. They're just planting it. They're not putting anything on. They're not putting any insecticide on. There's nothing, no insects yet. Didn't click in that those seeds were treated with insecticide at that moment. Anyway, to make a long story short, we found that that material from the planting and the air planter and the, the dust and the materials that move around during that planting operation were moving wherever the wind blows it. Uh, and they were moving a long way in some cases, and they were encountering bees that are very actively, as you know, and others know, very actively foraging in April and May. That's when you get that first flush of flowers, a lot of uh, mints at the side of fields. Uh, purple dead nettle is a familiar one to a lot of people. Um, some some winter annual weeds in fields that are, are perfectly acceptable to bees. You had a lot of intersection between foraging honeybees and other pollinators and the seed treatment exhaust uh, particles. So that's what started it. And then we sort of kept following these threads along and eventually we got to the efficacy and so on. So it's been a long, a long ride of sort of nailing down all these, these loose ends and these threads. And, and when the efficacy was so uh, uneven and hard to repeat and demonstrate and so on, 
that's when the solution became more clear is well we don't need to be using these all this much this is this is the use rate is way way beyond the need way beyond and um yeah that's kind of how we got to where we are now so we have a product that uh, you know from your research and several other people's research limited uh yield benefit definite cost factor involved with a huge litany of unintended consequences in addition to what you just brought up here, essentially a dust plume, not necessarily the insecticide coming through the plant getting to the bee. It was simply the dust plume, likely from the vacuum planter. As mm -hmm. every seed goes by the seed cell, it's sucking a portion of that insecticide and aerosolizing it. Think about the farmers that are running the planters, that are filling their boxes. You got bare hands, bare arms. You're pushing the seed around in the box or up in the central fill the plume of dust that's coming out as you load these. And then you're working on the planter right by the vacuum. You don't shut the vacuum down because you don't have to reload all the seed discs and such. Think of the exposure we're getting to farmer operators themselves. There probably is some. Uh, and I don't know anything about the human health dimension or, uh, you know, I haven't looked into that. Obviously, it's not my field. Um but there's, you know, with all of these pesticides, um, I think it's more important than ever to be very careful in terms of PPE and things like that. Uh, the more we know, the more we're realizing you have to take care of yourself in terms of what you're breathing, what you're touching and, and all of that. Um, and, and farmers are, you know, got to be close to the top of the list of, of a, a um, uh, exposure a vocation know. yeah where you have a lot of exposure to a wide range of chemicals that's but most of us don't even think about seed treatment being an issue right it, it just don't even cross your mind so that's uh so i've got a great suggestion on how we can avoid that uh, safety risk to ourselves and and all the unintended consequences uh don't use neonic seed treatments is, is that a yeah. is that a wild suggestion right there? Can yeah. can I say that you know and not get censored <laughs> here? I mean, uh, give it a try. Hard what's to do, worst, right? What's the worst that can happen? Give it a try and see what happens. Uh, you know, run a check strip, run a run a, a few rows like that. I mean, there are many ways to experiment without going all in, right? Uh, you don't have to completely abandon every every single acre of treated seed in one year. But I think a, a cautious approach of having a look at it, I think there's nothing wrong with that at all. That's how the, the best farming is done by sort of questioning and testing and probing and what worked in 2005 may not be right now. Um, the other thing I like to bring up when we get on this topic is that, you know, our uh, plant breeders uh, at, our, at our various seed companies and, and at universities and USDA as well, have been hard at work for many decades developing elite hybrids. And you've we've probably all seen those curves of those yield increases, especially in corn, um, where these plants are stronger, more durable, better at um, accessing water and nitrogen. They, they cold germ is better, et cetera, et cetera. They don't need as much help as we're giving them in many cases. So the plant tolerance and the plant durability is something that is very rarely mentioned when we talk about all these advances. So we still sometimes have these outdated thresholds that are based on, were done on corn plants in the 80s um, to, to, justify, to justify intervention. And so that's something where you know, entomologists could have redeveloped and redefined thresholds, but, and I thought about this early in my career, but I realized, well, nobody's using thresholds because everybody's treating everything all the time. So I could write a grant proposal and work on this and write up some papers on a new threshold for, you know, wireworm damage or some chewing insect on soybeans, but who would use it? You know, Point. it's, it's it's a uh, it's it was I think it would not get a lot of traction. But my point in mentioning that is that we need to to give those those plants and we all see it with our eyes how much taller the plant is. That knee high by Fourth of July thing is no longer really applicable, right? 
we have corn tasseling at, at that at that point in time often um you know nine feet tall and so i think that you know we need to do a better job of recognizing recognizing quantifying those differences and recognizing that the plant is doing a lot more of the work in repelling pests and outgrowing pest damage and, and so on than they used to. Um, these are very durable plants. These are just elite germplasm. That's where everyone will agree. Most of your yield uh, predictions are based upon the hybrid. And many of these hybrids are just uh, so much different than they were even a short number of years ago, never mind 30, 40 years ago. So that's a fact, a point in favor of, you know, reducing some of these insurance approaches and these prophylactic applications of insecticides, fungicides, and so on. The Ag Emerge podcast is brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. The ASN team is hands-on, digging in and invested in regenerative agriculture. Along with the proper plant nutrition and biologicals to boost your soil microbiome, we provide the ideas and implementation guidance to support you on your soil health journey. So stop farming the same way and contact Ag Solutions Network today at asn.farm. So I think what you're saying, Dr. Krupke, is that uh, you really want to get back to IPM research. So you're encouraging farmers to quit these seed treatments so you actually have an opportunity to get back to integrated pest management instead of just this blanket, you know, everywhere. So this is this is your secret plan, I can tell. <laughs> yeah, I, I guess. I don't know if I developed it that far in my head yet. But I, I suppose, yeah, it fits. Sure. <laughs> I, okay. I, I but, think I just like it when people experiment. I, I've always just sure. said, just try it. Just try it. A lot of people have trouble finding neonic exactly. free seed treatment. Um, exactly. So when I made my switch, it, it was really tough to find it. I had to uh, seek out a company that's non-GMO and organic only. Same way on the soybeans uh, in order to get the, the neonic free. However, recently, uh, there are opportunities. Uh, Bex being headquartered not too far from where you're at yep. there at Purdue, uh, they have their transition corn, organic corn, but also um, uh, I I was told that uh, by special request and you have to take all the seed and take it early and all those kind of things, you can look at getting it this year, uh, mm -hmm. neonic free. So uh, I've heard that too. Yes, you have to. Uh, you have positive to, development. It's very interesting because uh, farmers, guess what? You write the check. So if uh, you don't want it, just say. I'm not going to buy it. And it's, it's miraculous what happens. So uh, consumer is the most powerful force in the country. That is exactly right. So don't, don't just think you have to, you know, take what they've got. So can we dive in a little more on some of the unintended consequences associated with this? Because we got to have a motivation for, for those farmers to maybe not uh, do those uh, just to stand up and, and take no seed treatment mm -hmm. uh, seed. Mm -hmm. Um, want to run a theory by you with, uh, on residue decomposition. So residue decomposition, as you know, at about the same time as 04 and yield guard rootworm started becoming a problem. And I always thought that it's a more lignified plant when you insert the BT trait. Okay. So lignin, lignin isn't as digestible as, as other components of a plant, but that wasn't all, was it? And then, then we know that there's a lot of, um, uh, you know, bugs that are, um, uh, really good at uh, breaking down residues uh are they getting a spillover effect because of the neonics are they reducing the populations of like springtails millipedes centipedes or any of those little critters and spiders that help take uh large particles down to a smaller particle to interact with bacteria in the soil mm -hmm. yeah that's a good question and the springtails were actually that was actually one of the first groups of organisms looked at uh, by Galen Dively in Maryland uh, back in '06 maybe something like that. Didn't find an effect uh, of the neonicotinoids upon their rate of decomposing material. Okay. Um, spiders we do find an effect, but we don't know if it is because of the neonicotinoid or. In other words, the effect of the neonicotinoid itself is unclear, but in neonicotinoid fields, there are fewer of them. So it could be because their prey are suffering. Okay. Um, 
as far as do the residues that have neonicotinoids decompose more slowly overall? No, I'm not aware of any data that show that. Mm -hmm. At that point, the neonicotinoid residues in the corn plant are extremely low. They're not zero, and nor are they zero in the soil, but they're so low that you wouldn't expect certainly any lethal effect um, on an insect, but I don't even know if you'd see sublethal. So the, I'm not aware of any data that show that neonicotinoid corn stubble and residue uh, is slower to break down or more difficult for insects to break down than neonicotinoid free corn residue or stubble. Now, one of the reasons that I don't have those data, or nobody does, is because of what we've been circling around the whole time, and that is very difficult to get neonicotinoid-free corn seed, mm -hmm. especially in, you know, elite germplasm or in, in a hybrid that, you know, somebody would plant, uh, typically a commercial farmer would plant. And I've tried to get it various different times in different ways. First few years I was doing this kind of work. It was not easy, but it was doable. Um, and later it got increasingly more difficult. Um, I think now it's getting easier again. But my point is we should have many side-by-side -side studies in this largest crop in the country, very you know profitable crop, keeps a lot of people working and employed. We should have abundant comparisons, including the question that you just mentioned. Um, and it, any other question you could conjure up in terms of um, non-target effects on insects, treated versus untreated seed. But we have very, very few. They have some more in Canada, but that was only because they legislated for a while that you had to have untreated seed available. So one of the reasons we don't have the answers to your questions, it's difficult to set up a proper research trial uh, and, and do this kind of work. Um, it's, it's, just, it's just hard. Uh, because you can't readily get that seed. It's a special order. And then, you know, what are you using it for and so on? And, you know, you can imagine that it, it's not something that's it's not a, maybe a very popular line of research at times. <laughs> they, um, the industry doesn't tend to favor research that uh, encourages you not to spend money. It, it's a weird phenomenon. Well, yeah. Why, why would you want to? show something about a product that is is detrimental to to the sale of the product that doesn't make sense yeah who I wants forget. to know the truth only if it's convenient but <laughs> yeah so i think that's one of the reasons that a lot of you know answers to those questions like you've posed uh, aren't there um and i would say that you know the peer reviewed literature which is where we scientists publish a lot of our work is where you should see some more demonstrations of the advantages and the benefits. You said you may, looked around on websites and you find some yield benefits and so on. Why aren't those widely published in big journals? Why don't we see this multi-state study where you have fields in every, every single corn producing state side by side with Neonic without? Uh, we've been almost 20 years with neonicotinoid seed treatments on corn now, and we don't have a big macro study like that. Why don't we? What's the reason? I don't know the reason, um, but we don't, and we should. Uh, there's nothing preventing uh, anyone from publishing in those journals. If you have good data and it's well replicated and the science is sound, the statistics are done properly, you'll get it published, period. Um there, there are some uh, where they don't even have page charges, so that's not even an obstacle. So, when you think about it, though, there's 90, 92 million acres of corn. Almost all of it gets seed treatment. So let's mm -hmm. just say 90 million for evenness. And it gets seed treatment that costs somewhere between 10 and $15 an acre or or maybe per unit. I, I'd have to double check those units. So anyway, it's going to be somewhere between... Uh, uh, three three hundred fifty million to one billion dollars of revenue, of which the manufacturing costs are next to nil. It is a high margin product. There's a lot of reasons um, involved with with not maybe wanting to know that answer. But I'll just that's that's a comment of mine. I you know if you want to respond, you can. I I don't don't expect you to. But um, I, I would like to jump in a few more of those. Um, 
you know, maybe unintended consequences. In addition to, I, I've noticed on our farm a resurgence of uh, prairie birds because mm -hmm. we have insects now to feed the brood. Mm -hmm. uh, I've noticed a no problems with other insects that maybe I used to have. Uh, it's just everything's in balance. I see lots of insects out in our field, but not bad ones. And, and that's okay. Not all insects are bad, folks. But one one study I ran across is they're saying there's actually a change in the phylosphere, excuse me, phylosphere. So leaf surfaces. Uh, the bacteria on there are being modified by the use of neonics. Uh, mm -hmm. And also that the rhizobacter levels in the soil are actually reduced when the, in the presence of neonic seed treatments. Um, have you run across that? Are you find that interesting? What the yeah, I'm not familiar with that with those two studies. I have not read that work. Um, I know that there are so there's an explosion of studies of the knock on effects of neonicotinoids. Just an explosion. Uh, and, and our paper happened to be one of the first ones to sort of go, wait a minute, what's up with this stuff? You Look know? at what you started. <laughs> well, if it, not me, it would have been someone else. I mean, it was <laughs> just st staring us in the face, I think. But um, these, these are powerful molecules. These are extremely powerful molecules. So you say, okay, an insecticide is an insecticide. Well, no, because one of the key differences with neonicotinoids is how little, what a tiny dose it takes to kill an insect, how little material it takes to kill an insect compared to, uh, for example, pyrethroids, or going back even further, things like carbamates and our orga organophosphates. So early on when I was doing this work, um, they liked to tout, and, and it wasn't just industry, it was researchers, all sorts of people like to tell, look how much less active ingredient we're using in pounds per acre than when we were using granular insecticides for rootworm. We're using a fraction of the, of the weight of insecticide. Well, that's not informative because what's important about an insecticide is not how much it weighs. It's how toxic it is. <laughs> These materials are orders of magnitude more toxic per unit volume or per unit of, of mass than their predecessors. So what does that mean? Well, it means your margin of error is that much smaller, right? You have much less room for messing up before you start killing things. And there's a lot of things we don't want to kill. Uh, I have not met farmers that are not also conservationists and, and stewards. I mean, they, they like to see things on their land uh, other than the crop, you know? Crop is very important. Crop is what, you know, pays the bills and so on. But I don't think there's anybody that would just want to live in a world where it's just that, you know, and nothing else. Nothing else can live there because the, it's only hospitable for that one crop. And so as we've studied the neonicotinoid thing more and more and more, and like I said, there are hundreds, if not thousands of papers looking at non-target effects, we realized that because we've undertaken this experiment for nearly 20 years of using these powerful compounds on 90 million acres of corn, plus the other crops, we're seeing all sorts of effects that we may not have anticipated and some that we may never be able to measure because we can't go back in time and know what was there before. Um, and where I think that is going to be the most striking and we're starting to get into more is the water side of things. So, uh, particularly in fields that are tile drained. That water that goes through the field, we found, carries neonicotinoid down into the water table and out into the tile and wherever the tile drains, into the ditch. And then the ditch goes to, you know, a creek and maybe to a river and so on. So my point is that because they're so water soluble, we find them over and over again in the water, even far from agriculture, we find them in the water. And some water organisms are extremely sensitive to them. And I think now that we're 20 years in, in some fields and in some areas, some, some counties and states where we've been using these intensively for 20 years, you, you can't really know what was there before. But I, it's safe to assume based on the toxicity that you've lost some organisms. And a lot of them are water bugs, quote unquote, 
very uncharismatic. Some of them bite. Most of them are brown. But all of them, you know, if you follow that food web up of what's eating them and what they're doing, eventually you'll get to organisms that people do care about. You know, things like trout and other game fish, a lot of birds, migratory waterfowl, ducks, on and on and on. Those systems are very um, rich in biodiversity. It all depends on insects. It all depends on insects. Um, a lot of birds, a lot of birds feed upon aquatic insects or insects that are aquatic at some part of their life cycle. Aquatic insects are soaking in neonicotinoids a lot more than a lot of other organisms are. So we have the seed treatment that can move easily through the surface films of the soil to, to tile outlets, or let's say we don't have tile and, and it's still in the, in the water table, uh, in the, in the soil, how long can that be taken up then by subsequent crops or weeds or, or plants yeah. in, in the yeah. future and, and the <clears throat> persistence of that? That's a good question. Well, we, we looked at it a couple of ways and we, the first one was half-life. How long is it resident? How long can we find it again in the soil? It looks like the half-life in our soil is about three years. In three years, about half of it's gone uh, in the soil. And so six years, it's all gone. That vary, will, will vary tremendously across soil types, organic matter, hot, cold, precipitation, all those things. The point is it's, it hangs around for a little while. Uh, your question about whether it gets translocated into other plants, uh, the answer to that is yes, uh, into weeds and uh, plants beside the field. And that's been shown here. Uh, we did some of that work here. And also Dave Goulson did some of it in the UK. So it does show up in non-target crop nectar and pollen. So what does that mean for insects? Is it acutely toxic? No. It doesn't, insects that feed on weed, see, on weed uh, flowers that have imbibed neonicotinoid and are expressing it are not going to drop dead. But having said that, if you persistently find pesticides in pollen or in nectar, you're having this, you know, this constant stressor on organisms that eat pollen or nectar. I mean, it's just the same as if we would find, um, you know, asbestos. And, and we'd be breathing small amounts of that in or contaminants in our drinking water, um, you know, lead paint and all these things over the years that we found in very, very small doses over a long time can cause some very damaging effects. And these are no different. These are nerve toxins. They work on the nervous system of insects on that nicotinic receptor. And so the only two conditions aren't dead insect and healthy insect. There's a lot in between. And when you start messing with the nervous system, you're talking about orientation and find your way home and avoid predators and find a mate and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. These are all the things that an insect nervous system needs to be able to do. To do the experiments to measure the effects of very low doses of a pesticide, never mind multiple pesticides at the same time, which is usually what happens. But to do those experiments is very difficult and time consuming. But those that have been done, we know that well below the lethal dose, we have negative effects for insects on a behavioral level. So they can't avoid predators. They can't find their way home. They can't forage. They can't take care of young, et cetera, et cetera. So that's why the question you asked about, are they in weeds? Are they in soils long-term? Uh, yes, they are. And that's why we're concerned about it because it's a chronic stressor. It's a constant pressing on the health of the system. Um, and it's not, it's not something that we can say, well, it's worth it because we're getting all these benefits. We're feeding the world with, with, with these things. It's just not true. It's just not, not the case. These aren't the most indispensable tools that we have in our toolbox of, of managing insect pests. Um, most indispensable tools are a lot of the things people have been doing for a long time, uh, rotation, uh, you know, making the, making the environment less hospitable to pests, um, planting at the right time, buying the right hybrid, all of those sorts of things that people have been doing for a long, long time. And now that we have more 
competitive corn and beans than ever. Um, I think we're in a good spot to to go even farther with, you know, letting the plants, you know, go it alone in, in cases where we don't have insect pests. They're just not there all the time. The insect pressure just is not there all the time. And that's what most, that's sort of the underlying foundational hypothesis for this treat everything every year, is that the insects are just waiting for you to not be paying attention and not have seed treatment and then boom. But even when you think about insect life cycles and you think, well, I'm putting out this for about 20 years, I've been putting out this insecticide, very effective, very toxic, worth every penny, gets me yield benefits. Well, okay, well, where is this reservoir of insects coming from? How are they regenerating? If everybody's doing this and it really works well, well, how can this always be the same? <laughs> That's not how it works. <laughs> you should should have everything dead by now. Exactly. Exactly. And I did have somebody say that to me once. Um, he mentioned I was at a field day and he said, uh, well, the reason you don't see benefits from the neonics is because we've sterilized the soil for you. The soil is effectively sterile. There are no more pests there. And I said, oh, maybe. I hope that's not true. I hope it's not sterile. Everybody's but, got different ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Talk to me a little bit about the research you're doing where you uh, conventional versus resilient and uh, conventional would maybe be realized. Um, I had a good guest on a few podcasts ago. A conventional isn't, we, we say it's conventional, but there's nothing conventional about what we're doing. It's just the standard practice um, <laughs> versus uh, resilient where, where maybe farmers come with an idea mm -hmm. uh, and Hey, I want to try this. And then you're like, great, let's, let's, uh, let's take a look at that. Um, walk us through what you're doing there. I think it's kind of novel. Yeah, so what we'd like to do um, here at Purdue and at some of the Purdue Ag Centers, which are farms that Purdue uh, manages, owns the land, runs the farms, is set up some long-term comparisons of what we can call conventional, let's say traditional corn, soy, tillage, a, a, a risk-averse approach that we know works, pencils out done by you know thousands of uh thousands of farmers across millions of acres and compare that with some of these and and here we can get into the nomenclature of regenerative sustainable resilient and i like the term resilient because it seems to be a less polarizing term than some of the others right now and a less uh, uh pigeonholing term so when i say resilient i'm talking about for one thing, the, the tolerance and the durability that our hybrids and varieties have, taking advantage of that. For another thing, setting it up so that nature can help us work with nature instead of against nature. It's kind of a cliche, but it happens to work in a lot of systems. So setting things up so that we can have more beneficial insects visiting the field from time to time. So we can have ground beetles with something to eat in the field. Does that mean we let everything go and everything becomes a big weedy mess? No. Does that mean we're going fully organic? No. It means that every discipline, every sort of um, uh, research area, I, I know entomology, but I don't know plant breeding and I don't know the microbiology of soils and I don't know the intricacies of cover crops, but we, I have colleagues that do in the buildings all around me here. And I know those colleagues, and I've worked with many of them in the past. And many of us are interested in working together and working with farmers and putting our heads together and saying, okay, if you had to say what's the best idea in your discipline, where you have data, where you've done research on your little plots, so often one-tenth of an acre research plot, what have you seen that has promise that you would like to see if it pencils out on 20 acres or 50? Because you'll hear the criticism that, yeah, that might work in research, but that doesn't work on a commercial acreage. That doesn't work on a large scale field. So one of the things we'd like to do is do this work on larger fields at the Purdue Ag Centers. And again, by comparing side by side, so we're taking a hundred acre field, let's say for argument's sake, and splitting it in half. One half is continuing business as usual. It was last year corn, it's this year beans and so on. The other half is gonna take a different approach and see, okay, what if we start deliberately including a cover crop that will build organic matter very quickly. 
What if we include a cover crop that attracts beneficial insects because it produces a flower, pr it produces pollen and nectar, all of these sorts of things. Um, what if we add beneficial nematodes into the soil that can control rootworms instead of uh, BT hybrids, which often necessitate we have to have neonics in corn. So those are just some of the examples, but you get the point that what we're trying to do is take advantage of some of these um, initiatives and that are many of which are funded and, and supported by the federal government where they're saying they're incentivizing farmers to explore regenerative practices. Okay, well, what does that mean? And if you look, if you delve down into the websites of Cargill and ADM and some of these big um, uh, purchasers of corn, you'll see they're saying things like, living roots in the ground at all times, no bare soil, minimum disturbance. These are old ideas. These have been around a long time. Many farmers are already doing them. But at Purdue, we didn't have, don't have a place where we can bring growers where we're doing that on a larger scale, where we can say, look, this is how it looks. Maybe it's not going to look good some years. Maybe it's some things won't work. Certainly some things won't work. But at least then we can start to talk about it. And as new ideas come along, and it might be some of these ideas I'm talking about. It might be some technology type of approaches where you use um, drones or where you use robots to spray individual plants. So what does that next generation, what does that look like? What can we sort of do on these acres that is something some farmers are already looking at, but that the university and or a university isn't really embracing yet? So that's kind of what we what we want to get at. We want to get at a testing ground, an incubator for these new ideas. And the critical part is to have farmers there so they can tell us, no, that's logistically a nightmare. I'd never do that. I don't care what result you get. It's nuts because I can't, because of the X, Y, or Z reason, whatever reason there is. That's one of the critical parts of it. You know, we have plenty of expertise on campus in all of these disciplines. We have the tools, we have the equipment, we have lots of students. We don't have the, the knowledge of day-to-day -day farming and there's no substitute for that. So that's one of the essential components of it. And that's it in a nutshell. That's what we'd like to start doing. We're gonna start this fall. Um, identif I've identified some fields around the state where we're going to do the work, different soil types, different geographies. Uh, I'd like to expand it beyond just corn and soy. So we have a, a plot down um, in Vincennes, Indiana, where we're going to do some work with melons and looking at how we can, you know, get some of these principles and approaches in there and, and see what we can find. Um, just the little bits of kernels of information that I know from my colleagues and that you know, I'm sure, too. There's a lot of interesting little things that we can do that are not macro changes. We're not talking about let's abandon corn and start growing quinoa or something. We're talking about for farmers that are curious about, okay, I'm growing corn, but can I do this a little bit different? Can I do this other thing that may help with, I don't know, maybe they're interested in birds. Maybe their thing is aquatic life. Maybe their thing is just to have uh, more diversity in the field. Everybody has their own their own lever that moves them. But I think there's room to experiment and to have it done at a university site has certain advantages. Uh, and one of the principal ones is that we can control and maintain that we're not as vulnerable to the commodity fluctuations and so forth. Um, hopefully not anyway. Uh, and we can we can watch it closely over a period of years and see what happens. Watch things change. Um, abandon ship on some approaches that aren't working, change to something else. So it's early, early days, but we have the uh, land, we have people, and we're going to make it go. I really love the idea. A friend of mine says uh, farmers are not good researchers, and in, typically researchers are not good farmers. So. Right. Everybody needs to stay in their lane and do what they're best at. And I've always wanted to see, um, you know, researchers come off of the very small plot work. And I advocated for this a lot in California. So rather than doing, you know, an eight acre plot that's divided into, you know, four replications and two mm -hmm. rotations, it's like now we're down to half acre, you know, independent, independent rep. 
um, go out and document what farmers are doing. You know, mm -hmm. just just go out and look at the trials they've done, put the stats to it for them to, mm -hmm. to help them understand what they're accomplishing. You know, do the soil measurements, the bug measurements, the the plant measurements, the water infiltration, the you know, water savings, and and, and just document what they're doing rather than having to reinvent the light bulb. So I think that's outstanding. It's a similar approach, what you're doing, but you're going to do their practices on your larger farms. So that's, uh, that's outstanding. Kudos to you. I hope you learned some really interesting things from it. We will. We will. Yeah. Wish us luck. It's, it's going to be an ambitious undertaking. It's going to take a lot of, a lot of work and a lot of people. But um, like I said, we have, we have a lot of good people at this university. Um, we have the support of administration. And we're going to make it make a go of it, and we'll see what we can get to. Um, one of the downsides, of course, and this thought I, this occurred to me when you talk about the replication, is that we won't be able to split out what's causing what. You know, oh, is this because I planted the uh, that that cold hardy pea last year, or is this because I you know didn't cut the cereal rye until late? We won't know. We won't have cause and effect for everything because everything's going to be confounded. But that's what our individual plots are for. We have those answers from our individual research programs. Or if and you discover something like that, you can pull it into those small mm -hmm. plots to try to yeah. try to diagnose that. So Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Yeah. I think that I think there's a lot of potential there to find out some really interesting things. That long-term approach can yield a lot of benefits, but you have to be patient and we're so impatient in our in our culture in our society right we want to amazon prime these answers and <laughs> you can't amazon prime this stuff this is a long grind good good point and um uh, yeah I, i'm glad that you're taking that approach final thing as an entomologist uh, you and i are living in amongst the largest extinction event mm -hmm. on planet earth at this time Right. Uh, nobody knows that because our stuff from Amazon Prime is still coming, you know. So <laughs> all of a sudden, the Amazon Prime stuff stops. Then, then everybody's going to be screaming and you know wondering what's gone wrong with the world. But uh, that extinction event is being led by our uh, our favorite insects. Uh, talk to us about that, and what is your hope that will change that? And honestly, how much of a role could 300 to 500 million acres of stuff that we're doing have an impact on that? Yeah, that's a good question. I'm glad you asked that one. Um, so for those that don't know, yes, we're living through the, the largest mass extinction event in history. And that is not just insects, that's all sorts of animals. And we've probably all read about coral and depleting fish stocks. And there are many reasons for that, including the growing human population and what that means. It means we're going to replace forests with subdivisions, et cetera, et cetera. And the, the earth is becoming less hospitable for life, period, including for human beings. But we have ways of getting around that for now, uh, making it more hospitable in our homes. So every data set we look at, that's a long-term data set of trapping um, insects, the numbers are declining almost uniformly. And some estimates from Germany are in the 70s, 75% range since, since the middle of the last century. So it's 50s or 60s, 1950s or 1960s to now. And there, are, you know, there aren't a ton of those data sets where they trap the same way, the same year for decades, because you can imagine that's hard to keep that funded, hard to justify, et cetera. Economies, you know, go up and down. Insect trapping is not going to be near the top of the list of a legacy program. But the data we do have are pretty uniform, and they point at a huge extinction event. Huge. That includes pests. And this is another point I make to producers and farmers and pest managers is that, you know, yes, you're seeing less at the porch light on the windshield, and everybody will give you those anecdotal reports of, about monarchs and these sorts of things. The pests are less numerous as well. They're not robots. They're subject to the same stressors. And it could be climate change. It could be lack of habitat. It could be lack of forage, flowers, and things like that. It could be pesticides. It's all of them. Uh, but which one's number one depends where you are. So that's happening. So one of the ways to reverse it 
is to live with the animals and the insects that we can live with and that aren't competing with us for food or space or fiber. And that's the overwhelming majority of insects. You don't need to kill every single insect on an acre um, if you have a few soybean aphids in one corner of the field. But that's what we do. Uh, you can fly on insecticide for $4 an acre. And I just saw it yesterday. Uh, soybean fields that looked, and I walked in the fields, completely perfect. There was no mark on the leaves. There was no uh, fungal disease. There were no insects that I could see. Obviously, I didn't walk every single acre of the field. But I can tell you, those beans looked pretty good. But they were flying on something, probably fungicide and insecticide. That's the usual. So... Can we make a difference on 100 million, 200 million acres? I think so. Uh, I think that's a lot of acres. I think nature is pretty resilient and bounces back fast. And I think more importantly, that when you get that culture shift of just a few people saying, well, I don't need to kill everything except the corn. I don't need to. I can still have corn yields and not have to, uh, you know, pull out the big guns all the time. Uh, when you get a culture shift like that, that's how you can can get back to some sort of a moderation. Uh, and we see it in other systems. We have many, uh, especially systems, um, some perennial crops, where there's much more recognition of the active and beneficial role that insects play. We don't think that way in general for field crops. We just, we just don't. Um, and a shift on that many acres away from this, using this sledgehammer approach of, you know, pesticides wall to wall every year, I think could only be beneficial. So can we reverse all these declines? No, we can't. There, there are too many, too many stressors. There are too many people, et cetera. Uh, I don't think, you know, we're not going to go back to the 1970s when, uh, when some of us grew up and have that kind of system again, but that doesn't mean we just throw up our hands and give up. Uh, when everything, when every animal is declining, everything you want to count is declining in numbers. That's reason to worry, even if you're not one of those animals that's declining. <laughs> because you don't have to be a biologist to realize that it's a pretty connected world. And we pull out some of these Jenga pieces Eventually, we're not going to have a tower anymore, you know, and we're starting to to pull out some of the pieces. And, you know, we have a small, a, an opportunity to do a small bit of good. We have data and science to support it. We're not just throwing a, a Hail Mary pass and saying, hey, let's, let's go without insecticides, period. That's not what we're talking about. What we're talking about is getting to some sort of a moderation where it's not all the time, every field treated the same way every year. That's just ridiculous. There's no justification for that, um, period. There just, there just isn't. There never has been and there isn't now. And so I'm glad people are starting to ask these questions. Uh, I'm glad there's a podcast like yours that has an audience. This wasn't the case, um, you know, seven, 10 years ago. It, it just wasn't. So I think we can do some good. And, and I don't, want anybody to uh i don't want to prescribe anything to anybody but i do want to advocate for trying things differently because in some cases the way we're doing it is not beneficial uh to the long-term stability of the system um, and when i say the system i mean agriculture and beyond and and at the higher levels of organization too that wraps it up beautifully. I appreciate your your um, thoughtfulness on that, and also all the all the work you and your entire team have done uh, in regards to this issue. And look forward to continued great great work and and research coming out of uh, everything that you're doing, and also with this larger uh, program that you're embarking on. So, thank you. Appreciate everything. Yeah, thank you. Me. Thanks for having me on. You bet. Thanks for listening to this conversation today. I appreciate Dr. Krupke's desire to explore our pest management and help us discover opportunities to improve on our systems and build biology. And 
As always, if you'd like to learn more about what we're doing to help growers implement those soil health practices, check out our website at asn.farm. And there you can click on links to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. There's a lot of great things happening and always something to learn. Thanks for listening.